Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Zach Schloman, class of 1987, Law 1990. I'm a lawyer like Michelle, and I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship at Cornell, or as we like to call it, EHC. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our latest webinar brought to you by the Cornell Entrepreneur Network, CEN, Cornell Silicon Valley, CSV, the College of Human Ecology, and EHC. Cornell has some extraordinary entrepreneurs, as most of you know, and we're thrilled today to welcome Michelle Talbert. We have a special guest host, Rachel Donifon, who I happen to know very well, who is the Rebecca Q and James C. Morgan Dean of the College of Human Ecology. Uh, before we start, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, our format as usual today will be a conversation along with some Q&A. We'll be weaving in the questions that were submitted in advance, as well as taking your questions live. For the live questions, please use the chat box, by the way, and select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your messages. That makes it a lot easier for us. And by the way, I'll be monitoring those throughout the, throughout the webinar and popping on live to ask those questions. Uh, we are recording the program, so you can view it again later. You can view it on the CEN live stream channel and also the EHC YouTube channel. We'll put those in the chat box now. You can also see our previous episodes uh, in this webinar series, and there's actually a lot of them. And as a bonus, uh, Michelle has provided a, uh, or is providing a bonus link that has a lot of questions and comments and answers uh, that you can view separately. So let's get started. Uh, Michelle and Rachel, thanks and welcome to our show. Uh, Michelle is currently the founder of Her Power Space, among many other things, and she has built her career with a what I would say is a pretty fascinating journey. Uh, we'll get into that during our conversation, obviously. As I mentioned earlier, Rachel is the Dean of the College of Human Ecology and a big supporter of entrepreneurship on campus. So with that said, Rachel, take it away and I'll be jumping back on in just a little bit with some questions and uh, I'll be monitoring it throughout. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much, Zach. I'm really, really happy to be here with all of you and participating in this fantastic event. Um, the best part of which has been getting to know Michelle through our conversations. So Michelle, it's so great to have you here today and to talk with you. And I'd like to start by thinking a little bit about your early years and your journey to Cornell. And if I understand correctly, you were a divorced single mom with two kids. You were living in New Jersey and in DC, working a variety of jobs at the federal government and elsewhere, thinking about joining the, the Air Force potentially, <laughs> and all that time taking night classes at community college to get your associate's degree. And then at age 27, you landed here at Cornell and spent the next three years with us. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that journey and how Cornell was fortunate enough to have you join us through that path. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Zach, for the introduction as well. And, you know, it's funny. I graduated high school when I was 17. And I went straight into the workforce. I did think I was going to go into the Air Force, but I actually went into federal government work and met who would become my first husband. We had kids right away. So by the time I was 22, I had these two young kids under two and I was already divorced. And I had started taking classes one at a time at the community college at night when I was pregnant with my son. And I just knew I wanted something more, but I wasn't sure what that looked like. But I was like, well, I'll just start taking classes that interest me. So a psychology class here, a sociology class here, obviously, I'm a UMECI, right? So it's all these social sciences. I wanted to impact people, but I just didn't know what that looked like yet. And so for 10 years, and I have to say, I'm originally from New York, I'm from Queens, um, but we moved to New Jersey when I was like late, late in high school. And so after sort of years and years in community college, I was on the Honor Society, the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society. And I thought I was going to transfer to GW in DC. I was one credit away from my associates. I had to take like a PE, which I put off for years and years, obviously, right? And um, I got a recruitment letter from different schools and I would just throw them in this box. I wasn't paying attention. And then I got an envelope with some red letters on it. And it said, Michelle Talbert, would you be interested in coming to Cornell? 
So apparently different schools saw the listing of folks who got the Honor Society designation and said, let's recruit them. They could be possible candidates for our four-year programs. Cornell was the only one that made me go, oh my God, I got to apply. And the rest is history. I have been so excited to be a Cornellian ever since that day. Wow, I love that. I love that story. And it's a beautiful um sentiment about the importance of, you know, being open to those opportunities, you know, the, the random piece of mail that might come across your table and what that could mean for you. So that's, I love that. Speaking of random piece of mail, UPS just dropped off yeah. the package. I am here in the co-working space accepting mail for our clients as we speak. Well, that's just to show that it can be really life altering. Yeah. So you came to Cornell, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience at Cornell, and especially if there are two or three people who greatly influenced your time here, and if you could reflect on uh, what that was like a little bit. Absolutely. So, you know, as we said at the top, I was 27 when I came to Cornell. My daughter was going into first grade. My son was going into third grade. And that was what we call the beginning of our six-year odyssey. We're the three musketeers on this six-year odyssey. I was going to spend three years at Cornell, three years in law school, and get back down to D.C. for my son to start high school because I did not want to disrupt those four years. So we were on a mission, right? How many of you guys have been on a mission before and a plan? So we arrived in um, Ithaca. Cornell has on-campus student housing, which is amazing. And so I lived in a North Campus in a place called Hasbrook, had a community center. They did activities for the kids. It was such a blessing to be in that community. And I went to school on my very first day and I was all bright eyed and bushy tailed and 27, right? And my first class, I'll never forget, and Pam, policy and assets and management. And this like 17 year old, 18 year old kid stood up at the front of the room. And I don't remember the question that was asked, but he quoted Homer's Iliad. And I was sitting there and I was like, the only Homer I can quote is Simpson. I am. <laughs> I have made a huge mistake, right? And so I didn't know it was imposter syndrome, right? I came in with all this gusto and zeal and all of a sudden I was like, I'm 17, I'm, I'm 27, he's, he's 17, he knows so much more, I'm out, a fish out of water. And I kind of devolved a little bit that first semester. And um, about two weeks of not going to class, not combing my hair, I would just put the kids on the bus, lay down, and I had received a family scholarship through human ecology from a prior, from an alumni who is named Ruth Spears Nixie. And she created a little stipend fund for any student in human ecology who may have a family. And I was super depressed. And as benefactors are known to do, she came to campus. And of course, the college said, Michelle, you have to meet with her. Right? She's giving you money. And I was like, are you serious? OK. So I shoved my hair up under my hat. She took me to a really beautiful restaurant in the hotel school and she poured into me and I cried and she got it. She graduated as a divorced single mom in the seventies with three kids, right? She got it. And because of her pouring into me that day and continuing through my education, I was able to get it together and be like, oh my God, I can do this. It can be done. And so that moment in my fall semester, first on campus really changed everything because Ruth gave me a role model and just bolstered me. And she didn't judge me for that, that space I was in at that moment. So that was really beautiful. And then Jerome Siegler was former Dean of Human Ecology. I actually called him Grandpa Z. Mm -hmm. And I would go sit in his office and he always had beautiful English teapot and tea brewing and we would talk and he was so honest with me about my choices for my career. And I appreciated his honesty so much. There, I mean, innumerable people, but those two folks for sure That's just great. pointed to me. Hey, Michelle, I'm curious, what happened to the guy that, the young student that cited Homer? Oh my gosh, so we didn't work this out ahead of time. So three years later, happened to be like in a small, uh, like, you know, just like a small class and uh, upper level class. And one of his classmates, meaning another freshman who was now a junior, said to me, oh my God, we all thought that guy was a pompous jerk. I was kind of hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> 
Imposter <laughs> syndrome can take many forms, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Sorry, I had to just ask the question. No, Go ahead. no, that was a great question. And that really is the punchline for that story. <laughs> well, I love hearing, I love hearing, Michelle, how important, how open you were to different types of mentors and being mentored and how, you know, it's a two-way street with mentorship. And so the fact that you are open to those connections and then meaning something so much to you is, is really, I love to hear that. So I'd love to talk a little bit now about after Cornell, part of your, the other part of your six-year plan where you went to UPenn for law school and you were on a track and you decided to, do, to become a corporate lawyer. Um, fun fact, Zach is also a recovering corporate lawyer as well. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, what your experience in law has been like and how that set you up for all the wonderful things that you've been doing since that time. Well, I think for me, it's, it's been this opportunity to sort of complete some things, right? So you get the undergrad degree, you get the law degree, doing that later in life, I felt like I had a little bit more control over what I was planning to do. And then when I got to the law firm, that was a piece I actually wasn't really prepared for. Mm -hmm. I just was on this journey, but for that piece of it, what would your life look like as a corporate attorney? I hadn't thought that piece through. And when I got there, there were things about it that I absolutely love. I love drafting, I love negotiating, but the thing that I love the most is going out and networking and what they call rainmaking. And when you are a second, third, fourth, fifth year associate, they want you in the office, like grinding, looking at walls and in the computer, right? And so for me, that was the piece that made me realize, oh, I don't think this is for me, but what can I take away? And the pieces that I've been able to take away, of course, are critical thinking, relationship development, and my love of networking and connecting with people. So I was thankful for the opportunities that I had to attend events that enabled me to unlock that piece and realize, oh my gosh, you can actually make sort of a career out of this in and of itself. And then, so then in 2011, you evolved that, you know, you, you continued to evolve and thinking about what the right path was and you wrote a book and that really kind of helped you set, set you on the journey that you've been on uh, of recent. So could you talk a little bit about that book and how you, how you came up with the idea and where you've gone with it since then? Sure, that particular book is about online dating, specifically from the perspective of someone who's 40 and over, because by then it was my second divorce, unfortunately, right? And I was dating someone, we broke up, but then we came back together as friends and said, you know what, we have loads of kind of tidbits that we can share. So we self-published this book called Don't Do What We Did, right? And with that, I needed to find a way to market because you're self-published, right? This is 2011. I happen to be on Twitter. And with Twitter came opportunities to sort of insert myself into conversations happening around dating and sex and love and relationships. And Ebony Magazine, Ebony Magazine from my grandmother's table, my mother's table, my coffee table, came into my inbox and said, we'd love to feature you. Well, I was hooked. So now I have the networking piece, I have the social media piece, and it's like, wow, look at all these ways to connect with people and share your message. And fun fact, don't necessarily use LinkedIn until you're ready to talk about your extracurricular activities. Because the partners are like, we saw you wrote a book. Oh. <laughs> but with that, again, that helped me sort of decide, well, this is a defining moment. What are you choosing to do? And I chose to leave the law. So hey, Michelle, I'm actually curious. So, so what, what did you actually do with Ebony? Like oh, we were featured on their website. They interviewed us. It was a Q&A, took pictures, and um, it went out to all of their readers. And then was there any follow-up after that? Did you do anything more with Ebony going forward? With Ebony specifically, no, yeah. but I've been featured in Forbes and other publications. I've been a writer for Black Enterprise Magazine and other online publications as well. So yeah. it just sort of was the opening to be able to, to just have other opportunities to be featured and to write and talk and all the things I love to do. Okay. I mean, and, and this is one of the questions that came in earlier. So just let me interject for a second. Did, have you had, um, like, are you still in touch with the C-suite people at Ebony or some of these other magazines and social absolutely. media outlets? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, go ahead and ask the question. No, I was just going to say, and like, and, like, and, like, and like, how do you keep those connections alive? 
No, that's a great question. Um, two things. First of all, the connection started because I showed up with value. So for instance, Black Enterprise Magazine, who I wrote for for a long time, I was their social media correspondent. I went to the White House um, to cover different uh, meetings and things like that for them. I reached out to the executive vice president then probably via three unanswered emails over the course of two or three months, right? And I realized, okay, he's not answering, what's next? I stalked or to follow where he was doing, what he was doing on social media and saw that we were both going to be at a conference. So I went out of my way using my social media skills to highlight the things he was saying, what he was doing. I made my way to him and said, hey, I was just posting about you. This is great. I don't know if you remember. Boom, right? And sort of just adding value by amplifying his voice on my social media platforms, but then just also refreshing his recollection about the emails that I'd already sent. And I told him that, hey, I would love to cover what uh, the Women in Power conference. And he said, sure, get back to me. And I offered to fly myself down here to Boca Raton from DC to cover it if they comped me the ticket. And that's how that relationship started. So I invested in the flight, but I never had to pay for another flight with them again after that. Um, so for me, keeping connections begins with offering value, seeing what their needs are, meeting and exceeding those needs, and then continuing the relationship. And to this day, he's one of my mentors. Nice, nice. That's a great, like, proactive, you know, approach that, like, is thinking about your interests, their interests, and how they they come together. And I, I'm Absolutely. interested. I mean, it sounds like you know you published this book, and then you had this really strong interest and skill in social media, and so those two things really dovetailed, it seems, to help you really get this really strong social media presence and your work focused on empowering women. I know you say from the bedroom to the boardroom. And so you've really been focused on these hot, you know, hot topics of that we all face, such as relationships, sex, dating, single parenting, and love. And so can you talk a little bit about your strategy of using uh, media, using social media, and empower, using that in a way that empowers uh, people and addresses topics that we sometimes, you know, seem to shy away from? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I want to just kind of give this caution, this disclaimer, I have been willing to be more open about my personal life than most people would be comfortable. So I tell everyone, you know, just share where you're comfortable. That's the first piece, right? And so for me, I took an approach that we're all whole women, speaking specifically to women, we're all whole women. Right. So what does that mean? That means that we have obligations both outside of our households and within our households. And for me, I wanted to focus on the relationships that we have with ourselves, that we have with the people with whom we cohabit. And then once we leave the house and so dating relationships, networking, business, all a part of that ecosystem of what does a whole woman look like when all of the relationships in her life, beginning with herself, are all in alignment. And that's why to me, it's just very synergistic. Although it may seem like a scatter plot to others, it makes sense to me. Hey, Michelle, do you think that there are benefits to sharing more rather than less? I mean, I know you mentioned it's a personal decision and a personal choice. Um, it seems like your sharing more has been very helpful to you. Um, I, I tend to be the same way. I like to share a lot. Um, and I can't really figure out why, whether it's just my personality or whether it's getting benefit somehow, but I'm curious to, to know your thoughts on that. I think that people have to share something, right? You don't, we don't, we no longer transact with the McDonald's of the world in terms of where we feel like we've made a connection. But watching a Ray Kroc movie, maybe you do feel a little bit more connected now that you know, oh my gosh, that's the story behind the business. So that is with every piece of our business and corporate journey is letting people see enough of yourself to humanize you. And then you make that decision yourself. But there has to be a human element. I do believe gone are the days where you're just sort of just, you know, we all know Jeff Bezos' business, whether we want to or not, we know, you know, and, and, and whether you like the person or not, you, get, you have to get to know them. 
And so that's right. my advice to people. Share where you're comfortable, but you have to humanize your brand um, unless it's a completely anonymous brand. And that's very, very rare. Yep. How about, how about this one? It just came into the chat. It says, for someone starting out a small business, are there any concrete recommendations you would make to improve networking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, start local to the extent that outside is open where you live. Find ways to connect with um, other local business owners. Meetup.com is a great opportunity to connect with folks because it is based on in-person relationships. So you can search and it doesn't have to be for your business. You can search for things that are interest to you because that's another way to make great connections with people and business can flow from there and you're in a comfortable environment to begin. Um, another way to do that is if you have a brick and mortar business, invite people to your business, have open houses. If you're I'm in a corporate office park, I had an open house and had pizza brought in locally, local black woman owned pizza place two blocks <laughs> away, she brought in the pizza. So find ways to set yourself apart, think creatively, and um, sort of, yeah, think creatively about things that are outside of just your industry and make relationships that way. Cool. You know, I love, I love Michelle, your really holistic view of us as people and the, you know, the private to the public and everything in between. That's a very human ecology mindset. So I can see you uh, with that human ecology education very proudly in your life. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what, what kind of initiatives you're most excited about right now? You know, you've evolved and you have this, this really focused, this really important mission about empowerment and the whole human. So what are some of the things you're focused on now and some of the success stories that you're most excited about with your most recent initiatives? Absolutely. Um, when COVID hit, so I've opened the doors of Her Power Space, which is my first brick and mortar space. And if it's okay, I'll answer a question that's in the chat from Gil. He said, what resources did I use to fund my business? If I had my wallet here, I would hold it up. I'm 100% self-funded and um, just, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the work that I do on a contract basis, consulting and um, doing some legal work here and there, but please don't tell anyone, um, is what has funded my business until it was able to make you know, money from our community of um, clients and customers. So that's what I did, Gil. Um, so yeah, so when COVID hit, I was only three months into business. And our community was very, very much in pain. And the PPP ran out and a lot of things just kind of came at all of us all at once. And I launched something called the No Small Business Left Behind Summit Series. And on, in the beginning of May, that first summit was six hours long. We had speakers coming in to talk about how to crowdfund your own PPP, talking about opportunities and ways to stay afloat. And to date, we've highlighted over 150 businesses through that initiative of No Small Business Left Behind. And then I also have the Unchamber, which was launched semi as a, a, an option outside of Facebook for business owners to come together on an online platform. And we continue every month to have meetings and highlight business owners who bring in resources for our community and share about great ways to succeed in small business. Those are really important to me. And I have women in our community that through her power moves, walked into our first meeting in 2018 with no clients, no clue. And now they have a full roster of clients. They have full um, you know, calendars and they understand what it takes to actually run a business. How do you come up with the ideas? Um, hmm. If I say universe and it's just kind of divine as part of it, the other part is interacting and listening to my community. Um, a great example in, in the space, I have business mailing address services. During the pandemic, one of our clients said, hey, Michelle, can you scan my mail to me? And I was like, why didn't I think of that? Absolutely. So now that's an income stream for us, right? So you listen to what your customers say they want. And if it makes sense for you to be able to pull that into as vertical, absolutely. Wow. Scanning mail. I, I've actually never heard of that. So, so you open the client's mail and literally scan it to them. 
Correct. And they receive it and it's a touchless delivery system. And then they let me know, you want to recycle it, shred it, or just come in and pick it up another day. But people get it mail right away. I, I give them a picture of the front of everything that comes in. Right. But if they want it scanned, then they can actually um, buy into that service as well. Nice. Nice. Um, I have a, a related question um, in terms of networking. You mentioned unchambered. Did, do you have any experience with forum groups? So small pods that, that stay together um, and meet typically monthly. So there's like YPO, EO, Kindred. These are all forum groups for entrepreneurs or business folks. And I, I'm asking for a slightly um, self-motivated reason that we just started um, entrepreneurship at Cornell just started a forum group offering uh, for Cornell entrepreneurial minded alumni, uh, which we call the Kiuga Forum. Um, we, we haven't launched it yet. Well, we launched it and we have about 100 people signed up um, and we're gonna form our pods very, very soon, like in the next couple of months um, and actually launch the product. But I'm curious whether you have any personal experience with, with forum type programs. Absolutely, I do. Um, two things, one short term, one longer term. So the shorter term was a lean startup competition that lasted over a weekend. So like a hackathon, right? We, we came together, you have to pitch your idea, the, the top four or five ideas that win, everybody then is broken up into groups and you have to operationalize that. So our team won that, which was an awesome, awesome experience. So that was a lean startup piece. The longer term, I did a six month program here under the University of Florida's Jim Moran Institute for Entrepreneurship. And they have two tracks in different counties around Florida where they have a nonprofit track and they have a for-profit track. I did the for-profit track. We met every single week or two. It felt like a lot. We met a lot. Um, and we had different speakers come in. We got to know each other. We formed bonds within that group. And we just sort of learned and, and boot camped our businesses. Right? And then those relationships continue formally and informally after that. I think uh, masterminding is a concept that's been around for a very long time and has been spoken about in Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich book um, quite, quite extensively. It is the best way to bring new energy to your business and new thoughts and new ways of doing things to expand beyond your own limitations and to pour into other business owners with your own life experience. I think they're, they're a great resource. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the reasons why we launched the forum was um, to allow alumni to do what I call peer-to-peer -peer coaching, um, where you have this small group of, that, that becomes trusted over time um, it's not like you automatically trust everybody, but over time, uh, this trust builds up. And our goal really is to get people into these pods and have them, you know, interacting for years, like, like not just about business, but personal family, business interests as well um, over time. So it's, it's an experiment, but we hope, we hope it works out well. And that's our model for her power moves. We have three chapters. We have Broward, Miami-Dade, and Jacksonville, and then we have one that will who are connected to us online. But those three chapters, when we were open, met in person, and then we all stay connected online. Yep, excellent. Excellent. Sorry, Rachel, I didn't mean to hijack Oh, not that. at all. No, this is great. So Michelle, when I think about your journey that you're describing it, I hear you know some things that really stand out to me. Are you, you know, listening, listening to others, being open to others, pivoting when you know crises or issues come up, you, you're able to pivot quickly? And really always evolving. So I'm just curious to hear now, if you look forward, what are what are a couple of areas that you love to focus on in the future? And where do you see yourself making an impact in some emerging or new areas for you? Um, for me, and I'm gonna say it's one because it's weighty. I don't need another outside of this. For me, if I had my druthers, I would be able to travel all over the country working with teams, corporations, um, business owners, and others, helping them create safe spaces for their teams, employees, to be able to have conversations that are not necessarily easy, but are necessary, to ensure that everyone feels included. This is like the DEI conversation, diversity, um, uh, equity, and inclusion, right? I focus on the inclusion piece. How do you have 
an organization where people feel safe around each other, where there are boundaries that are set and everyone understands them and everyone takes responsibility for their own actions and for keeping each other accountable. What does that look like? Because to me, that looks like a relationship that's built in safety, no matter where it is, whether it's in the workplace or at home, right? And I think sometimes we tend to divorce who we are when we step out of our door. And we take all of our personality with us. And if you are working closely with someone, it's going to come out at some point, right? So why not be able to sort of um, prophylactically identify topics, create opportunities, and have communicative tools to ensure that you're successful? Because when people are happy in the workplace, it's not about money. After a certain point, you find the research shows time and time again, you max out on the money and people are still miserable and leave, right? And it's not about that piece. It's about feeling vested in their environment. And the way to feel vested is to feel included. And so for me, that's what that looks like to me. I call it safe spaces. Other folks call it DEI. I don't care what you call it. Let's just do it, right? And do it well. I call it life skills, right? This is about right? being a human and being ourselves and having those conversations, even if they're difficult and being able to do it with skill and respect and empathy. Right. Recognizing our privileges and recognizing our hurdles. And there are tools that you can put in place. I've actually done it with groups that you can help barriers to sort of, you know, begin to shrink because people go, oh, I see the humanity in you. Yeah, I think that that human piece is actually super important in all types of relationships. I'm going to move that concept of, of, of humanity into how do you deal with C-suite people compared to other people? Like, do you have different <laughs> strategies? Um, do you treat them all the same? I mean, it, it, I asked this very directly. I, the question. Yeah. I tend to treat people all the same. Um, you know, I mean, Rachel knows this. I mean, she's on my board of directors for my program. And I, everyone goes by first name basis and it's all very casual, direct conversation. It seems to work out well. I don't know if that's luck or whether it's just, I have a lucky, a lucky group of people on my board. Um, but I'm curious how, how you actually do that and what advice you should give to others. And to me, what I hear in that question is an underlying thought about positions of power. That's really where that differentiator gets made, right? Because if I'm an entrepreneur, people who walk in this space, if our energy doesn't match, I'm okay repelling who doesn't align with mm. our community. But I am in a position of power in these doors because all money isn't good money, right? We've already identified that piece. So when you are interacting with someone and they are in the C-suite and you are not or not yet in the C-suite or more junior in the C-suite, there is that tendency, just like with a mentee and a mentor, to feel like there's a superior, sort of inferior, subordinate, um, you know, supervisor relationship. The goal here is to find commonalities and the humanity. So I don't wanna give that short shrift. What I'm saying is to talk to people, ask to take them to coffee. Pay for the coffee, even though they make more money than you do. What a concept, right? They're going to offer, let them pay for it. No, but you offer first. <laughs> you know, there are ways to show up and stand apart because you're not behaving in a way that most people behave. And so if you can capture opportunities to be different, people will notice. And then you get the other opportunities to, to excel in your workplace if that's your goal. Right. That's my take on it. And that's what's happened and, and was, was beneficial to me in a corporate environment. But I had to get there, right? Because I already talked about imposter syndrome. I had to get to that place, um, but it, it took a little while. But when I got there, man, I got it and, it and it worked. I brought opportunities to my partners for them to shine. That's actually great to know. Um, a couple other questions, if you don't mind, or Rachel, jump jump back in whenever whenever you like. We should make this as interactive as possible. Um, so we had a bunch of questions, Michelle, that came in uh, from 
the people who registered in, in advance. So I'm going to take a couple of those now and we'll sort of see, we'll just see where it goes. Um, so here's one, it says, how do you ask people for favors and investment for your own ventures without ruining relationships? Okay, so the assumption there <laughs> is that there is a relationship, right? And so if there is a relationship, then it should be mutually beneficial. And therefore, are you asking for a favor or are you inviting them to an opportunity? Because if you shift the, op if you shift the understanding of what their needs may be and then position yourself if you really believe that there is value to them to invest. I mean, investing time, money, if we talk about ROI, returns on investment, right? So I'm an investor, I'm not doing you a favor, I'm investing in your business and you better get a return that's in alignment with my goals. So that's how you approach it. You're bringing value. You're giving them an opportunity to buy into something. But you also have to understand that if it's a super personal relationship, you have to be very clear that people understand and expectations are set, especially. But if it's a relationship, then it should be mutually beneficial. That word relationship means how we interrelate with one another, not just how you give or someone only receives. It's mutual exchange. Gotcha, that's great. Michelle, I also wanted to follow up on that with a couple, combining a couple of questions that we got submitted in advance. And I also want to tell everyone that I'm going to have to sign off myself in a little bit because I have a staff awards event to go to shortly. Yay. But you know, something we were talking about before this began, Michelle, was the idea of being an introvert and what this type of um, you know, networking and these activities look like for those who are introverts. And so how do you think about making these strategic connections for those who are introverts? And especially um, you know, making that initial connection can be one thing. But the follow up without, you know, doing a follow up with confidence, but without being annoying or being worried about being annoying is sometimes the, the struggle for people, maybe especially when they're more on the introverted side. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny because uh, introverts, you would think, would excel in environments where we can't be in person face to face. But for some introverts, it's even more pressure because they're putting so much pressure on themselves about number one, not contacting people too much. Or number two, what are the words that I'm saying? Are they right? Are they OK? And overanalyzing that piece of it. So I have so much utmost respect for introverts. Thank you for just getting out of bed and, and you know, trying to interact with people. We applaud you. I'm not. I'm serious. It can be rough, right? So for me, I find that the advice that I love to give to intro introverts is to be very well prepared and understand your needs, your ask. You understand your needs, your ask, and your goals. And in person, once you get to that event, if you've achieved those goals, you can leave. As soon as you feel uncomfortable, leave. You don't have to knuckle through or put yourself through a whole lot of pressure to go to an event and continue to like press palms if you're not comfortable. So if you set your goals ahead of time, I know that I go to this event, I wanna meet Zach. I know that if I go to this event, I wanna be able to speak with the conference um, organizers because I'd like to be on the stage. Yes, as an introvert, you'd like to be on the stage, right? So that's in person. If you are doing this in written correspondence, it depends on how you've connected with them. If you're connecting on social media, see what they're posting about. Again, see what they care about. See what matters to them. What are they talking about? And then incorporate that into your correspondence with them electronically. Um, there is nothing wrong. There's a new thing that a lot of people say these days, which is, hey, just bumping this up in your inbox to make sure that you didn't miss it. I actually missed um, responding to someone's email today, as I mentioned earlier, and I feel terrible about it because I saw it started and then didn't get back to it. It happens. We get busy. Don't worry about the part about being a pest. Honestly, in some cases, if they feel like you're being a pest, they'll say unsubscribe, delete, stop messaging me. Typically, a no response is a, I just didn't see it. I didn't get to it. It's not necessarily a high priority. And if that's the one, and just give it a little bit more time, bump it back up in there, and maybe change a little bit of your verbiage, say something a little differently, see what else they've been talking about, give them a new hook, change the subject line, whatever that looks like. But if you're pouring into them, people respond to what they have value, where they find value. That's interesting. So Rach, you have to leave now? 
Yes, thanks so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Michelle. This was a pleasure and I really enjoyed participating with all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Rachel, thanks so much. So we're gonna continue on folks for about another, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. So keep the questions coming into the chat. In fact, I wanna to go to one right now. Um, I just lost, oh, it says, what mentality helps you overcome rejections? Um, uh, <laughs> Jack Daniels, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> seriously, overcoming it is uh, probably an overstatement. Maybe incorporating it and thinking about how I can do things differently going forward. Um, I have a big ego. I'm not gonna lie, right? And so if I get rejected, the goal is to not take it personally, take it professionally, all of that stuff, whatever. Um, the reality is what can I learn from it? I don't know that it ever stops stinging. It might just sting a little less. That's my truth. There might be people who are like, I don't care what anybody says. I'm not that person. I do care, but I do not let it debilitate me or keep me from moving forward. Yeah. That's the key. That is the key. However you interact with that um, rejection emotionally has to kind of be tempered with, but I still have to keep moving forward because I believe in this dream. I believe in this goal. It was given to me. I'm going to find a way to get this done. Yeah. I mean, do you sometimes look at what other people might view as a rejection and just not view it as a rejection? So somebody says, I don't have time now, or I mean, it, it maybe it's just easier to brush it off and say, listen, I mean, people don't have time for me. Like, like that's okay. Um, well, yeah, every no is not necessarily a no. Some is not right now. Some is timing. There, um, so I gave a presentation in two, the December of 2018 or 19 to a really large organization. It was like 3,000 people. Um, and I followed up. We had a great communication following up. And about six months later, I pitched myself again to that person for a different product, for a different um, uh, presentation topic. And I didn't hear anything. And I reached out maybe one more time. And I was like, ah, okay, I'm going to move on. Because now it, this was my take on it. We already now have a relationship established and you're not replying. Maybe it wasn't as great as I thought it was, or you <laughs> said it was. Okay, I'm going to let that one sit. Do you know, March, February of 2020, or maybe March, whatever it was, um, she reached out to me earlier this year, we're in 2021, She's, I don't know what year we're in, um, and said, Michelle, I just came across this email you sent me like a year ago. Can you please come and talk to our audience again? So sometimes it's just an oversight, right? But you have to keep moving forward. Did it stop me from being on other stages? Absolutely not. And I was so relieved when she came back around. Um, yeah. But the reality is we're all overworked. I don't, most of us say last year, we're talking about 2019, right? So it's a lot for a lot of us going on right now. So you have to kind of understand that everything's not about you. I think that's the best advice I was ever given. Don't think so highly of yourself that every interaction that you think that someone is thinking about you as much as you think about yourself. Right. I mean, given that, I mean, you come across as a very confident person. Do you think of yourself as a confident person? And I know it sounds like a silly question. It's not. Um, but I'd love to hear your take on that. I think of myself as a holistically confident person, but are there pieces of myself that I am not as confident in? Yes. When I'm like speaking, I'm pretty confident. I don't think I need to go into what I don't feel confident about myself with, and I'm confident to say that. Um, but what I am <laughs> confident about is knowing that I am really good at helping people formulate or forge relationships. Yep. I'm good at formulating strategies. I love to talk. I love to interact. And I love to help people. The things that I'm not great at, um, I don't think they need as much attention in my life. Right? Yep. Absolutely. So how about this one from the, from the chat? It said, what helps you power through imposter syndrome? And the person writes, this is Matt. He says... I often have self-doubts and understand it's a continuous exercise. So what helps you power through it? What helps me a lot is having great peer relationships and people who know me and also having what they call an add-a-girl file. 
So what or an attaboy file in your case, <laughs> that, right? So what that is are testimonials, uh, employee reviews, things that other people have said about me that are great. They're like, we really like you. We knew that Sally feels I'm dating myself. We really, you really like me, right? To be able to refer back to that is kind of pouring into myself a little bit from an external perspective even if my internal needs a little bit of time to catch up with that in that moment. Um, what I also find is very helpful is building the success muscle in a particular endeavor. So starting small, we don't walk into the gym for the first time in six years and think we're gonna bench 250 pounds. We work up to that. It's the same with success. Set a small success, need it, ah, get a little bit of wind beneath your wings, Go on to the next goal, the next goal. Incrementalism, I think, has been very helpful for me, myself, in building my muscle. I used to shake and quiver and sweat, and my palms were sweaty, get, you know, public speaking. And I absolutely thrive off of it now because I continue to do it, even though I was afraid, even though I thought everybody was staring at me. I had lipstick on my teeth. Whatever it was, <laughs> whether it was true or not, didn't matter. The point was I still showed up. And if you yep. can just show up, that is a little success to celebrate in and of itself. Yeah. So we had a bunch of questions submitted in advance um, for people that were either switching careers or thinking about switching careers. So I'm just going to read one of them. And um, this covers a couple of the different questions. It says, I'm changing career directions in a new field for me, for which I actually went back to school for, and need to make new contacts in this new area. How should I credibly find new people? Absolutely. Uh, that's a great that question. No, that's a great question. And I think that this is actually a strategy that's been around for ages and it's called informational interviewing. When you reach out to people who are doing something in a field that you have an interest in, reach out to them and either offer to buy them coffee, offer still something of value, right? May I take you to coffee? I am looking to make this transition into your industry. I see that you are the top blotty blotty hoo ha what, because people love to talk about themselves. I would love to learn more about your journey. What have you found? Again, making it about the other person, but you'll still get a lot of value from that plus forge a great relationship. One of the best ways to stand apart is to be different. One of the best ways to be different is to talk about the other person instead of yourself. That really leaves an, an impact on people. And so if you are transitioning into a new industry, reach out in a way that's not salesy. It's not, I'm trying to get a job from you. It's not, I'm trying to sell you my widget. It's, I'm trying to learn more about your journey because I'm really intrigued or interested in this interest, industry and I'd love to make an impact. You see how that shifts the conversation. Yep. How about do you... And this is not, I'm not plugging Cornell, but we do have a great network at Cornell. I do. I plug um, Cornell every day. Yeah. I mean, I, well, of course I do all the time too, but I mean, do you use that Cornell connection actively? Have you seen people use it? I mean, in my, in my job, I tell students to use it all the time. I mean, like use what? to utilize the Cornell network, like find somebody at that new company you want to get involved with that went to Cornell, reach out, use the Cornell to Cornell connection. Sometimes on LinkedIn, it shows up, right? Mm -hmm. um, or if I just happen to know that somebody went to Cornell, I might reach out and say, hey, do you know such and such? They graduated your year. Um, if it's a new person, sometimes I'll use the Cornell connection, but not as much. It's more becomes a fun fact that gives <laughs> us a quick affinity, but it's yeah. not always the thing I lead with. Um, yeah, I, I, I always call it the false, the false sense of Cornell trust. <laughs> like, oh, I went to Cornell, you went to Cornell, you must be okay. Right, um, right. So it is a, it is a, an interesting touch point. Um, here's a tricky question. Can you share the best icebreaker type of questions or comments you might make among, you might make among people you don't know? Absolutely. Um, so you're at a conference and you try to meet somebody. Um, and is, any tips for getting from, one, from point A to point B? Yeah, I actually have a visceral reaction to people asking me what I do. And if I'm in a smart ass mood, hopefully I can say that particular phrase here. That's fine. Um, I will say for what? For fun? For money? <laughs> what are you asking me, right? Um, how about instead, what brought you here today? Is there a particular speaker you're interested to hear? Um, 
what industry are you in that made you find this of interest? You, that's a shift. It's not what you do. It's what are you interested in? Right. Right. And so changing the conversation, that tweak in and of itself is something that I really do all the time. And it's a totally different conversation. I might never know what that person does. Who cares? We're at this place together. We both have an interest and we take the conversation from there. Yep. Um, somebody else asked, it's just a random question. How many people do you have on your team, your work team that are sure, assisting you? Yeah, um, for her power space, I have four independent contractors who we call concierges of the day, notaries, et cetera, who are on mm. call. I'm here every day. If I have something else to do, then we have a concierge of the day. I'm looking forward to firing myself from that because I have definitely given myself a job, right? But <laughs> also I have um, a VA. We have a call center here relationship. So um, certain sales calls and things of that nature can be made um, out. I, I'm big on outsourcing as much as possible. And then yep. with our Her Power Moves community, we have Fem Force leaders in each of the chapters. So they lead those chapters and I lead the overall vision of the organization. So um, delegating as much as possible, but often I do a lot of it. And that's just a lot of trial and error. And standard operating procedures have saved my life in this last year, creating <laughs> systems like how do you open the door? How do you turn on the, the lights? So, it, you know, just literally being able to hand that to someone so that it, it, it gives a seamless um, presentation to our customers and clients when they come in the, in the doors. Yeah. Now, I know that your children are now um, adults. Like they're, I forgot how old they are. 30 or 32. Yeah. And my so grandson is eight. <laughs> have you been able to pass down this advice to them like do they actually look at you as a as a guru in this area my son called I put myself on mute when we first went live I was like yeah I wanna he actually just launched a um catering company himself he lives in Montana so he's okay. an entrepreneur and my daughter just got her master's in social work from Howard the Howard University in Washington D.C. this May and what was interesting and actually made me cry was when I got back from her graduation, my son texted me early in the morning and said, mom, do you realize that each of your kids uh, took your journeys? And I was like, oh my God, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> one did all education, the other one's entrepreneur. And they were with me the whole time on both parts of that journey. Um, so yeah, yeah, it, it, the kids pick up what they pick up along the way, don't they? <laughs> well, it sounds like they picked up the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually great. Um, here's one. It says, how to restore an opportunity. I'm just looking right at the chat. It says, if someone has brought value and only positive reviews to a consulting opportunity, but someone who is no longer at the company ended the opportunity because of a concern raised over missed payments at a last minute cancellation, opportunity was great and the concern for payments will never be raised again. I'm not quite sure what the question is. <laughs> I think they're asking how to restore the, how to restore that opportunity. Well, can I talk about reputation? Maybe yeah, yeah, that actually, that, yeah, that'd be um, super. So there's a, I have different mentors. Some, I have coaches consultants and mentors, right? And so with a mentor, they typically walked in your footsteps or you're walking in theirs um, and they're guiding you and typically not necessarily paid. My coaches and consultants are paid and they might take either a more of an academic approach, et cetera, to teaching and, and guiding. And so with that, I've had a mentor in the past who had an eight figure business and literally had a $5 million contract. And early in that contract, something went very left. And he, as the CEO, made it his business to reach out to the client to restore mm. the relationship, <clears throat> took full ownership. And this is a reputation piece. So it doesn't matter what the issue is. If you lose or possibly potentially lose an opportunity, take ownership talk about how it won't happen again, the things that you've put in place to avoid that happening again. And if it goes away, that's fine. Lesson learned, implement the systems to keep that from happening again. And that goes forward with the reputation of any business or business owner. Yep, so that's great. Apply that broadly. 
So we have another question. It might be our last one that came into the chat, um, which I love. It says, how does one go about getting a mentor who wants to invest in you as a person? So you see this question, you're asking for an investment. What will you invest into your mentor? What is it that you could possibly bring to your mentor's life that will make their life richer for having the opportunity to mentor you? And again, it doesn't have to be that cup of coffee or financial. It could be that you actually implement some of the um, advice that they give. There's this term called an ask bull, someone who asks and asks and asks and asks and never actually implements. That will turn off a mentor very quickly, right? Are you in alignment with what their interests are for this phase of where they are in their career, their business, their life? and then show that value to them. Are they at a place where they feel that they can pour back into you? And how about this? Do you have mentees? I guarantee there's someone in the world who would love to be in your shoes right now, even if you don't want to be in them. There's someone who looks at part of your journey and says, you know what? I'd like to be there. Find that person, pour into them, see what it takes to be a good mentor, and then turn around and do that to help your mentor mentor you, right? That's synergy. That's investing in each other, not just investing in you. That's great. Well, I think we're actually at the end. That was a very fast hour, as usual. We're going to actually save the chat questions for you, Michelle. Um, and if you have answers you want to share with those, um, you can let us know, and we'll send them back out to our back back out to our network. So. We have we oh, have a, a, a link, uh, herpowermoves.com slash bonus. I actually have a video that folks can look at. A lot of these questions have been asked um, in prior presentations that I've given. And so okay. if you want to go on that, you can look at the videos there. I have a bonus for introverts as well. You don't have to put in an email address. It's herpowermoves.com slash bonus, B-O-N-U-S. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pop that in the chat, I think, in a second. If Amanda or Kate could do that, it would be great. Oh, there it is. Okay, super. Um, so as a reminder, today's event was recorded, and you can certainly view it again, uh, both on the CEN live stream channel and the ETC YouTube channel. And I also think it'll be available on the CSV uh, website as well. Um, a quick reminder, if you haven't seen it already, um, our next big annual conference for entrepreneurship is coming up in November. It's called Eclectic Convergence. It's on November 12th. This year we're having it at Cornell Tech, uh, or you can tune in virtually, uh, but it will be live at Cornell Tech in case you're in the area. Uh, the link is in the chat box now. Thanks again, Amanda. Uh, we have some amazing speakers as we always do at this conference, including the 2021 Cornell Entrepreneur of the Year, uh, whose name is Jessica Rolf. Jessica is actually a former student of mine, so that makes it even more special. Uh, so we hope to see you then. Uh, Michelle, thank you again for, for joining us today. Go Red. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> All the places you'll go when you go to Cornell. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Zach, and the Absolutely. Dean, everyone who worked hard to put this together. Amanda, everyone, thank you. Yeah. And thank thanks you. for all you participants who chimed yeah. in with all your great questions and great attention. Question. Uh, when you. the webinar ends, by the way, it just goes off in a heartbeat, so there's no time to say any formal goodbyes, except for this one. See you all later. Um, Amanda and team, thanks so much. Michelle, I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye, everybody. you. See Bye. You.